In this section, we'll talk about what to do if we have even more than two predictor variables, because we can actually make models with quite a few variables. So if we had up to k predictors, then our model would be y equals beta 0 plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2 plus all the way up to our last slope times our last x variable plus our error term. And if you get to this situation, then how would you interpret your slope? So if we have something like this, we'll say our slope beta 1 is how much y will change if we increase x1. by one unit and we keep all the other variables or other x variables the same. So our slope is always how much will y change if we increase this one specific variable by one unit and everything else stays the same. Or you can also say if you prefer after we account for all of our other predictors, so that means keeping all the other variables the same. If x1 increases by one unit, y will increase by our beta one units. Conditions for our multiple regression model are very similar as when we did just our basic one, um, one x variable linear regression. You can see page 200 if you want to look at those again. The standard error, okay, there's a few different thing, places where it shows up on our chart, so let's talk about each of them. You're used to looking at estimating the standard deviation sigma. This is the standard deviation for all the residuals with the standard error S, or it's the population of the residuals. You can also, as part of all of this computer output, they'll tell you what's called a mean square error. So you take the standard error and square it, that's the S squared. So you'll see places where it'll look like MSE or mean squared error, that's what they're talking about. And the mean squared error is estimating the variance of our population of residuals. Okay. So sigma is our standard deviation of the population of residuals, sigma squared is the variance. Let's see, so looking at the output, we can find our mean square error and standard error for our fuel example. So standard error, it'll say standard error, that's your S standard error for all the residuals. Notice down here it also has some standard errors. Those are different, those are related to the actual intercept and slopes for your X variables. This is the standard error for your entire model. And then notice how it had an M, S, and residual is another term for error. So M S E mean square error is our S squared, is that 0 0.1347. And if you try, if you do 0 0.367 and square it, you will get 0 0.1347. So what is our standard error? Our standard error is 0.367 and our mean square error is 0.1347. Then there's something called R squared and adjusted R squared. So we always have variation in our data. You can think of it as total variation equals explained variation, okay, what you can explain with your line. And I say line, but now that we have more than one X variable, it's with our plane or our model. And then the unexplained variation basically is what we can account for yet, or just like kind of that natural variation from person to person. Or maybe other variables we haven't thought of. or other variables we haven't thought of. So our multiple coefficient determination is just like what we did before for our single variables, but now we call it a multiple coefficient determination. 
r squared is equal to our explained variation over our total variation. So r squared is our proportion of variation in the y values explained by our model. We want r squared to be close by to 1. Higher r squared values means our model fits the data better. And we call it the multiple coefficient determination because we have multiple explanatory variables. So let's use our output to find r squared for our fuel example and interpret it. Well, I mean, pretty easy. We just say r squared equals 0.974. The interpreting part is where you come in. So remember, it's the percentage of variation in the y values we can explain with our model. So that means we can explain 97.4% of the total variation in the y values in our y's fuel, of the total variation in the fuel consumption values with our model. Okay, Or that means like with our x variables. which are temperature and chill. So that seems like a lot of the total variation. That is a very good model. Now, note here, when we use just temperature and ignore chill, R squared was 0.899. When we use just chill and ignore temperature, R squared is 0.758. Those are still both pretty good. But notice when we use both chill and temperature, R squared equals 0.974. So which one of these models explains the most variation in the y values? Well, the model with both chill and temperature explains much more of the total variation. Now the model with the highest r squared value will make the most accurate predictions. So if you have a choice of different models, one way to choose is to pick the model with the highest r-squared value. Now we have what's called adjusted r-squared. So some statisticians like to use the adjusted multiple coefficient of determination. So it's adjusted r-squared. The reason for this is it kind of helps you avoid overestimating the importance of your x variables. So what it does is it accounts for how many x variables you have. Okay. Because sometimes adding another x variable might add a little bit of predictive power, but it's just not worth the effort of having an extra x variable for the benefit you actually get from it. Okay, So it's just some way of accounting for the trouble of having another x variable versus like how much good it's really going to give you. But adjusted r squared is always slightly smaller than r squared. There isn't a good interpretation of it. Just know that higher adjusted r squared values are better. And we would pick the model with the highest adjusted r squared value. So to find the adjusted r squared value, we just look at our output. Okay. So adjusted r squared knows it's slightly lower than our r squared, not by much though. So it was 0.967. Oh, sorry, 0.963. Now we have something called the overall F test. So if you have K predictors and you want to know if your model will be useful, you need to test to see if the slopes are zero. So your hypothesis, your null hypothesis would be that all of the predictors are zero. The alternative is at least one of the slopes is not zero. So the null means that none of your predictors will have a significant relationship with your response variable y. The alternative means at least one of the predictor variables has a significant relationship with your response variable. The F test statistic, so F and we put model here. Models from a previous class, you probably don't even really need it. So just F equals our explained variation divided by K. Remember K is your number of variables over the unexplained variation divided by your sample size minus k plus 1. So k is your number of variables, n is your sample size. So k is number of x variables, and n is the sample size. 
Now, that's not too important to you, but what is important is you realize it's some way of measuring how much variation you can explain in your model versus how much unexplained variation there is. This test is designed so we only care about the right tail because we want our explained variation to be high compared to our unexplained variation. And if the explained variation is high, that gives us big numbers. And we'll just use the p-value from the output. You might notice that we're talking about explained variation over unexplained variation. That might seem similar to ANOVA. Remember, we did ANOVA to compare population means. And in fact, the table on our computer output will say ANOVA. The reason why is ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. And there are many different forms of ANOVA that can be used for many different things. It's just some way to analyze the variance. So for our fuel example, we have our x variables, chill and temperature. We want to use the output to draw a conclusion about whether the explanatory variables have a significant relationship with the response variable. So looking at this output, I see a few things like fuel consumption, that would be my dependent response variable, y. I have k equals 2, that's my number of predictor variables. n equals 8, that's my sample size. I have r squared and adjusted r squared. I have r for my correlation. I have my standard error. And then I have this, now it says ANOVA table. You can see here I have degrees of freedom, 2 and 5. That's my numerator and denominator degrees of freedom for my F-test statistic. But we haven't really talked about that too much. Really, all you're going to care about here is F. F is 92.3 and my p-value is 0 0.0001. So, let's go ahead and do our thing for our hypothesis test. First, alpha equals, I'll just say, 0.05. We're not going to really worry about checking our conditions for multiple regression, because we already have enough to worry about. We'll save that for our graduate level class. So we can skip the conditions. For your null hypothesis, it would be that all the slopes are zero. And the alternative is at least one of the predictors or predictor variables has a linear relationship with fuel consumption. Now next is my test statistic, which is F, you just read it off here, so 92.3, and my p-value equals 0 0.0001. Well, that is a small p-value, and I will reject my null. And I'll say that we have evidence that at least one of the predictor variables has a linear relationship with fuel consumption. Notice this doesn't tell me which variable has that linear relationship. For that, I have to go on to test the significance of just one variable. So what if we know from the F-test that at least one variable is significant? We probably want to know which variables are significant, so we can do a t-test for each of our individual variables. To do that, we'll just look at our computer regression output just like we did when we only had one variable. See back to section 11.11, let me change that page. So in your notes, that page will be updated. So you can go back to look at what we did with one variable. So each variable will have its own t, test statistic, p-value, and even confidence interval. Now remember, Megastat Excel automatically did a two-sided p-value so that your slope is not equal to zero. If you want to test if the slope is negative or positive, just divide the p-value by two. So let's use our output for our fuel example and test each predictor to see if it has a significant relationship with y. 
So first, let's test to see if temperature has a negative relationship with fuel consumption. So we'll use alpha equals 0.05 for both of these. My null hypothesis would be that the slope for temperature equals zero. My alternative would be that my slope is less than zero because it says negative. My test statistic would be T equals, so go to temperature, pick your test statistic of negative 6.394, and your p-value, well, this gives me a p-value, but remember, that's a two-sided p-value. For our case, this is a left then, so we only want just the left tail. So what we'll do is we'll divide it by two. So we'll do 0 0.0014 divided by two for 0 0.0007. So that's my actual p-value. That's a very small p-value compared to alpha. So that's a small p-value. So I'll reject my null. And so we have evidence that temperature has a negative relationship with fuel consumption. Now we're going to do the exact same thing with chill. So once again, we'll do alpha equals 0.05. My null will be that my slope for chill equals zero. My alternative well, notice this wants me to do positive, so we'll do that that slope is greater than zero. For my test statistic, so for our test statistic, T equals, let's just scroll back up. So my T for chill is 3.749, and the p-value, my two-sided p-value is 0 0.0133. So we have 3.749. And my p-value, now this is a greater than, we want positive, so we're looking for the right tail. So we don't want that two-sided p-value, we need to divide it by two. So the p-value on the chart was, once again, 0 0.0133. And if I divide that by two, I get 0 0.00. Six, six, five. Well, that looks like a pretty small p-value. So that's a small p-value. We'll reject our null. And we have evidence that our chill has a positive relationship with fuel consumption.